The conventional narrative tells us that Columbus's voyage marked the first known contact between the Old World and the New World. But what if the echoes of Egyptians' exploration of America resonated long before his fateful journey? As we uncover evidence that defies conventional wisdom, we find ourselves grappling with perplexing questions. Could the ancient Egyptians have exchanged knowledge with the indigenous peoples of the Americas? Did their ships truly traverse the treacherous seas, uniting civilizations separated by continents? Join us on this riveting journey as we sift through the sands of time, seeking fragments of truth that challenge the speculations about the Egyptians' discovery of America. The Intriguing Tale of Egyptian America Exploring the mysteries of history, a previously unquestioned belief regarding human presence in the Americas roughly 14,000 years ago faces a profound challenge due to a remarkable discovery. Within the expansive terrain of New Mexico's White Sands National Park, echoes from the distant past have arisen, the unearthing of footprints that predate previous estimations by an astonishing 23,000 years. This revelation instills a sense of uncertainty as we endeavor to construct the enigmatic narrative of South America before the arrival of European explorers, who, regrettably, contributed to the erasure of much of its history. Amidst the various conjectures surrounding pre-Columbian interactions between the Old and New Worlds, one particularly intriguing hypothesis shines forth. It posits that ancient Egyptians embarked on a remarkable transatlantic voyage in a bygone era. The appeal of this notion resides in the compelling evidentiary breadcrumbs from antiquity. While these ancient Egyptians did not partake in the vibrant nightlife of Miami's clubs, Evidence of their indulgences has surfaced through meticulous examinations of their mummified remains. In the year 1992, a German toxicologist unraveled long-concealed secrets from the depths of time. Hidden within the wrappings and preserved within the stomachs of these mummies, an unexpected tale began to unfold. Within these remnants, a curious combination came to light, traces of a powdery substance resembling the white snow and the essence of tobacco. Intriguingly, neither coca leaves nor tobacco were known to thrive in the lands of Egypt or anywhere in the known Old World during that era. The question that naturally arises is, how did these foreign elements find their way to ancient Egypt? The answer, akin to a faint whisper from across the ages, hints at a potential connection to the Americas. This revelation proved to be of such profound significance that it garnered the attention of the Discovery Channel, which produced a documentary to delve into its far-reaching implications. However, as is often the case with extraordinary revelations, skepticism emerged from the shadows. Critics voiced their concerns, suggesting that the custodians of these mummies in the 18th and 19th centuries may not have exercised the necessary vigilance in preserving the integrity of the evidence. Allegations arose, insinuating that these caretakers might have indulged in tobacco and treated the mummies with the very substances now under scrutiny. As for the enigmatic white substance, one can only speculate about unexpected turns that may have occurred in ancient archaeological gatherings. It is possible that these ancient Egyptians, too, partook in their own form of revelry. Sumerian Stones and Egyptian Reeds we have encountered another compelling piece of evidence that reveals an intriguing connection, one that spans different continents and historical eras. We are not just considering a link between Egypt and America, but also the possibility of a fusion between Sumerian and American cultures. Our focus now turns to a mysterious location situated on the shores of Lake Titicaca in Bolivia, not far from the bustling capital of La Paz. Lake Titicaca, a natural wonder of exceptional beauty, cradles within it a remarkable ancient site known as Tiwana Ku. This site is shrouded in mystery, with its meticulously crafted stones serving as silent witnesses to a bygone era. The question of its origin and the skilled hand behind its construction remains an enigma closely guarded by history. These massive stones, characterized by their precise craftsmanship and celestial alignment, stand as imposing sentinels, inviting awe and wonder as we contemplate the artisans responsible for their creation. As we gaze upon these awe-inspiring structures, we are left pondering whether they are the work of Egyptians, the legacy of African architects, or the masterpieces of Sumerian stone masons. 
Could it be that the wisdom of ancient civilizations transcended oceans and continents, finding its expression in these monumental stones? But there is more to this story. Beyond the grandeur of Tiwanaku, we observe the nearby shores of Lake Titicaca, a place steeped in the ancient tradition of reed boat construction. The people of Bolivia, inheritors of an age-old legacy, crafted boats using the very reeds that grace the waters they navigate. These reed boats, which provide a tangible link to the past, bear a striking resemblance to the papyrus ships created by Egyptian hands. This connection is not fleeting, as these vessels also bear a resemblance to the reed ships that once sailed on Sumerian waters. Two cultures, separated by vast distances in both geography and time, find themselves united by the shared artistry of boat building. Decoding the Enigma of the Fuente Magna Bowl Back in the year 1960, a remarkable discovery unfolded near the enchanting shores of Lake Titicaca, captivating the minds of curious explorers. It was none other than the enigmatic Fuente Magna Bowl, a vessel that seemed to have journeyed through time to grace us with its cryptic presence. Amidst the tranquil beauty of the surroundings, this bowl emerged as a true puzzle, its surface adorned with inscriptions of a script that defied all local conventions. The etchings danced upon the bowl's exterior, whispering a language unheard of in those parts. The puzzle only deepened, and diligent researchers soon unveiled its hidden secret. The language was none other than the ancient cuneiform Sumerian script, calligraphy as old as five millennia. Imagine the thrill of decoding these mysterious marks as if cracking open a door to the past. The words unfurled, and a tale unlike any other echoed through time. The script danced with the spirit of celebration, a hymn dedicated to the goddess Nia, known as Nimu, in the forgotten symphony of Sumerian culture. Nia had long held a sacred place in the hearts of North African civilizations and the cradle of Mesopotamia. Curiously, a symbol of fertility, a frog, leapt prominently amidst the script, etched onto the bowl's surface as if to embody the very essence of life. This amphibious emblem had also been etched into stones scattered around Tiwanaku, whispering of the deep connection between symbols and civilizations. Such revelations unfurl a tantalizing question. Could the whispers of the Sumerians, those pioneers of numerical abstraction, have traversed the globe, embarking on a journey that spanned continents and cultures? Could their ancient wisdom have traveled all the way to the lofty terrains of South America, where it sowed the seeds of a new civilization? African Echoes in Mesoamerica Let's venture a bit further north into the captivating realm of Mesoamerica, a land that beckons us with yet another enigma, a puzzle that has set the fires of curiosity ablaze. The Olmec heads are ancient artifacts that have weathered the sands of time for over three millennia. These enigmatic creations were skillfully hewn from colossal blocks of basalt, a formidable rock that yielded only to the most determined hands. Upon first encounter, these heads cast a gaze that transports us to a distant horizon, their countenances bearing a striking resemblance to individuals with unmistakably African features. An extraordinary thread is woven here, one that dares to suggest a pre-Columbian connection between Africa and America. Intriguingly, whispers resonate that the helmets adorning these visages mirror the headgear donned by the Nubian and Dogon peoples. Could this be the missing link, a testament to an ancient transcontinental journey? But hold on, the tale unfolds with nuanced layers. Like a storyteller with more to reveal, there exists an alternate narrative. Enter the indigenous spirits of the region, whose features dance in harmony with these monumental heads. A symphony of shared traits emerges, creating a chorus that resonates with the land's original inhabitants. Yet our voyage through time and stone is far from complete. The Olmec civilization, shrouded in veils of mystery, presents itself as an enigmatic fabric woven from whispers of a bygone era. In search of Abu Bakari II, Mali's forgotten explorer king. In the year 1324, an extraordinary account emerged from the heart of the Mali Empire. It wasn't just a tale, but a puzzle that hinted at the potential rewriting of the story about how people first came to the Americas. At the core of this narrative 
were the royals of two African nations, their aspirations and the chance of a voyage across the Atlantic many centuries before Christopher Columbus embarked on his historic journey. Imagine the splendor of the Mali Empire during the 14th century, a kingdom rich in culture and resources under the leadership of the ninth Mansa, Musa. As Musa embarked on his pilgrimage to Mecca, he carried with him a story that would captivate and mystify generations to come. In the lavish city of Cairo, he shared this remarkable narrative with an Arab emir, an account later documented by the renowned historian Al-Amari. According to this story, Mansa Musa assumed the throne of Mali in 1312, following a predecessor whose fate was shrouded in mystery. What made this tale intriguing was the predecessor's audacious belief that the vast Atlantic Ocean could be conquered. Motivated by a fervent desire to explore these uncharted waters, the king dispatched a formidable fleet of 200 ships, carrying men, gold, and supplies for a journey spanning year. The narrative unfolds as recounted by a returning ship's captain. They sailed for a considerable time until they encountered a massive river with a powerful current, not an ordinary river but an oceanic one, now identified as the Canary Current. Rather than continuing further into the vast ocean, the captain chose to follow the river's course, leading them to an unknown destination. The rest of the fleet was lost to the sea, their fate remaining a timeless secret of the depths. However, the king's thirst for discovery remained unquenched. Despite doubts about the account, he resolved to undertake the voyage himself, assembling a fleet of 1,000 ships, half for his entourage and half for supplies. As the ships set sail, Mansa Musa entrusted his empire to a faithful steward and left behind a realm in turmoil. Yet, both the king and his men disappeared into the depths of the Atlantic, leaving behind a mystery and a realm in disarray. The identity of Musa's predecessor remains a subject of debate. Was it the enigmatic Abu Bakari II, or does history hold another name? The truth is hidden by time, but one interesting fact stands out. There's a big river in the ocean called the Canary Current. It starts near West Africa, goes across the Atlantic, and touches South America's shores. This natural thing, named after the Canary Islands, could change what we know about exploring the sea. We wonder if people from old African civilizations used this river to cross the Atlantic and settle in America. Did the Malians or others do this? This idea excites our imaginations, but also makes us unsure. We don't know for sure if Egyptians met Americans before Columbus. We're left with more questions than answers, looking through time's haze for bits of truth. The Polynesian journeys, backed by history, show how ancient people were amazing at navigation. Did Africans predate Columbus in the Americas? The discourse surrounding the possibility of Africans predating Columbus in reaching the Americas is a subject of profound historical intrigue. It is essential to delve into the geographical aspects of this narrative, for the spatial proximity between Africa and South America is a pivotal factor that warrants exploration. Remarkably, the closest points of these two continents stand separated by a mere distance of fewer than 3,000 kilometers. Additionally, the Cape Verde Islands, situated off the African coast, emerge as a strategically advantageous restocking station. Considering this geographical context, a journey from the Cape Verde Islands to South America would encompass a relatively modest expanse of less than 2,600 kilometers. An added dimension to this geographical equation lies in the prevailing wind patterns over the equatorial Atlantic, which consistently propel winds from Africa to South America. These winds, recognized as the Northeast trade winds, historically served as crucial elements in the voyages conducted during the Columbian Exchange and the era of colonization. This confluence of factors implies that traversing the considerable oceanic expanse between Africa and South America could have been an expeditious and efficient endeavor, contingent upon explorers possessing a nuanced understanding of the regional maritime dynamics. Notably, Discussions regarding the potential arrival of Africans in America prior to Europeans can be traced back to as early as 1862, coinciding with the discovery of the monumental stoneheads belonging to the ancient Mesoamerican Olmec civilization in modern-day Mexico. Upon scrutinizing the facial characteristics depicted on these colossal heads, 
an intriguing resemblance to Africans was observed, deviating from the indigenous populations. Consequently, conjecture emerged, positing that these sculptures either held Africans as their intended subjects or were crafted by Africans who had journeyed to these shores. It is imperative to acknowledge that these notions have met substantial skepticism within the academic community. Nevertheless, they have engendered an enduring discourse regarding African engagements in the American continent. In the wake of these inquiries, alternative theories have materialized. Prevailing consensus suggests that Native American migrations transpired across the now-submerged Beringia Land Bridge connecting Alaska to Siberia, an assertion largely substantiated by genetic analysis, which links Native Americans to their Eastern Asian ancestors. However, it is intriguing to note that many of the oldest human remains discovered in the Americas originate not from the Beringia region, but rather from further south, nearer to the geographical center of the continent. A notable exemplar is the discovery of the remains of an adolescent girl affectionately referred to as Maya in the Yucatan Peninsula of modern-day Mexico. Remarkably, this region lies at a considerable remove from the proposed initial entry points of humans onto the American landmass. Comparative analysis of the skeletal structures of Maya and other early American inhabitants diverges significantly from the morphological characteristics typical of Native Americans encountered by Columbus. Notably, their facial features appear smaller and shorter, while their cranial proportions are elongated and narrower, a configuration that contrasts starkly with the stereotypical Native American cranial morphology. Facial reconstructions of Maya and analogous remains underscore these disparities, suggesting an alignment with individuals of African lineage and possibly Native Australian or Pacific Islander descent. Consequently, this intriguing confluence of anthropological evidence leaves an open question regarding the extent and nature of African presence in the Americas during pre-Columbian times, enriching the tapestry of historical inquiry into transcontinental interactions. The Pre-Columbian Norse Encounter with North America It is widely acknowledged that Christopher Columbus was not the foremost European to set foot in the Americas. The Norse, a people of Scandinavian origin, had already established settlements in Iceland and Greenland nearly a thousand years ago by the year 950 AD. By 999 AD, Leif Erikson, a notable Norse explorer, departed from Norway with the intention of Christianizing Greenland. However, an unexpected shift in the wind caused him to deviate from his course, leading to the serendipitous discovery of a hitherto unknown landmass. Subsequently, Erikson returned to explore this newfound territory venturing as far south as New Brunswick in Canada. It's worth noting that the settlements he established were temporary, and due to unsuccessful trade interactions with the native inhabitants, Erikson ultimately returned to Greenland, unaware of the true significance of his discovery. Evidence corroborating this voyage includes the remnants of Viking settlements at Landsoax Meadows, as well as historical accounts documenting the journey. By most standards, this represents the sole definitively confirmed encounter between the Old and New Worlds prior to Columbus's historic expedition. However, this does not preclude the possibility of earlier discovery events. Continuing with the theme of European exploration, there exists a contention that the Romans may have reached the Americas millennia ago. Presently, we have documentation indicating that the Romans ventured as far as the Canary Islands, situated off the African coast, a distance exceeding 4,000 kilometers from the nearest part of mainland America. The principal evidence suggesting Roman transatlantic voyages stems from objects discovered across the New World that exhibit craftsmanship reminiscent of Roman workmanship, distinct from any Native American styles. One of the most prominent instances is the Tazumal figurine, which was unearthed in a burial offering dated between 1476 and 1510. The terracotta head exhibits feature that many scholars consider to be notably European, deviating from any known indigenous art styles. After extensive analysis conducted by a panel of distinguished art historians and archaeological experts, a compelling consensus emerged. It was concluded that the enigmatic figure in question bore stylistic resemblances consistent with the artistic conventions prevalent in Roman sculpture during the second century. Nevertheless, this attribution has not been without its critics, with some challenging the authenticity of the artifact 
and conjecturing that it might have arrived on these shores subsequent to Christopher Columbus's fateful voyage. The Granada Bay Shipwreck Saga In a separate instance of extraordinary discovery, the coastal depths of Granada Bay, nestled within modern-day Brazil, revealed a trove of submerged historical intrigue. In the late 1970s and persisting into the 2000s, the remnants of a shipwreck came to light. Among the treasures unearthed from these aquatic depths were numerous ceramic jars. Upon meticulous examination by experts, these vessels were determined to be consistent with the characteristic amphora style commonly utilized by both Greek and Roman civilizations. Interestingly, such amphorae were so commonplace that mariners of that era often discarded them into the watery abyss to expedite navigation, unburdening their vessels. The underwater exploration unearthed fragments from an estimated 200 of these amphorae, sparking tantalizing speculations of ancient European interactions with indigenous communities in this distant Brazilian region. Nonetheless, alternate hypotheses have surfaced, positing scenarios such as a wayward merchant ship, potentially en route to the Canary Islands, or the possibility of oceanic currents depositing the wreckage in this locale. While numerous conjectures abound concerning the interactions of ancient Europeans, particularly the Romans, our journey through a historical enigma takes a detour to the Emerald Isle. To grasp the essence of this particular enigma, a cursory understanding of an archaic Irish script known as Ogham is essential. This distinct script, originating around 500 CE, relies on various combinations of incised lines upon stone pillars to symbolize distinct letters, an extraordinary and unparalleled script in the annals of human writing systems. Within the heartlands of Virginia and West Virginia, North America, puzzling rock carvings surfaced, dating back to the era between 500 and 700 CE. These enigmatic inscriptions bore striking resemblances to the Ogham script. The incongruity of such findings, separated by nearly 5,000 kilometers from the Emerald Isle, naturally led to fervent speculation regarding a potential Irish influence on this distant continent. Nevertheless, it is imperative to emphasize that these claims have not garnered widespread support within the scientific community, and alternative explanations remain elusive. Yet, nestled within this labyrinth of historical mysteries, the Irish narrative weaves its own separate tale, a legacy passed down through generations. Many believe this ancestral lore may hold clues that intricately connect with the intriguing narrative surrounding the Ogham-like inscriptions in North America. Now it's time for today's subscriber pick. It is time for today's discussion. This vivid illustration transports us to a scene of exuberant merriment and convivial unity, underscoring the enduring human gratification of social interaction. Observe the gentleman and lady attired in intricate attire, delighting in each other's presence. Can we surmise if laughter and jubilation resounded along the banks of the Nile as they exchanged narratives? Envision the stories they exchanged and the graceful dances they engaged in. How did their gatherings fortify interpersonal connections and foster a sense of communal solidarity? The ancient Egyptians, akin to contemporary society, held a profound reverence for fellowship. While we contemplate these figures encapsulated in time, one cannot help but speculate. Do our contemporary festivities trace their origins to these spirited foundations? Let's know what you think about what we just showed you. Mysteries of St. Brendan's Epic Voyage St. Brendan, an Irish monk of renowned courage and curiosity, embarked on a remarkable odyssey during a time shrouded in the mists of history. Around the era when these enigmatic markings first adorned cave walls, Brendan and a devoted entourage of 14 monks set forth from the emerald shores of Ireland in pursuit of uncharted territories. Their destination? The enigmatic Isle of the Blessed, a place whispered to be a paradise beyond imagination. This adventurous expedition unfolded as Brendan and his faithful companions sailed across the vast expanse of the Atlantic Ocean. Along the way, they encountered a mesmerizing array of wildlife, some familiar, while others remained utterly alien to their senses. Human encounters were not uncommon, with descriptions of individuals possessing darker complexions, hinting at the diversity of lands they traversed. 
As their voyage unfolded, Brendan and his band found themselves embroiled in various captivating escapades, fostering an intriguing narrative rich in adventure and mystery. However, with the passage of time and their insatiable thirst for exploration, the decision to return home was eventually reached. During the return voyage, the intrepid crew encountered what are now believed to be symbolic references. A volcanic island reminiscent of Iceland spewed molten rocks in their direction, mirroring the island of blacksmiths in their legendary journey. Additionally, crystal pillars, an allusion to floating icebergs prevalent in the North Atlantic, marked another chapter in their epic saga. Remarkably, in 1977, British explorer Tim Severn recreated this epic voyage using a traditional Irish Kirk boat, demonstrating the feasibility of Brendan's voyage and validating the enduring allure of his tale. Columbus's African Voyage Mysteries Intriguingly, Columbus's encounters in the Americas have spurred contemplation regarding the origins of its earliest inhabitants. It is worth noting that the fossil record in America, not limited to this discovery alone, reveals the existence of ancient specimens predating those unearthed in the Beringia region. This compelling revelation casts doubt on the traditional belief that Asian explorers traversing the Beringia land bridge were the inaugural settlers of the Americas. Instead, it prompts speculation that the continent's first residents may have hailed from Africa or even the Pacific, further enriching the narrative of its human history. Delving into Columbus's expeditions, a particularly notable expedition is his third voyage to the Americas. Chronicled by the Torian historian Bartolomé de las Casas, this voyage was undertaken with a distinctive purpose. Columbus's primary objective was to substantiate claims that had reached the ears of King John II of Portugal. These reports detailed the launch of canoes from the West African coast, specifically Guinea, venturing westward across the Atlantic Ocean. Their cargo included not only commodities, but also, intriguingly, human beings. These West African voyages held the promise of trade, and King John's curiosity was piqued regarding the ultimate destinations of these precious goods. In response to these intriguing accounts, Columbus embarked on his westward journey from Africa and in doing so, encountered the vast continent of South America. While the veracity of the tales surrounding African merchants remains unverified by tangible evidence, the physical existence of the lands they were purportedly journeying towards lends a degree of credence to these enigmatic narratives. Nevertheless, it is essential to acknowledge that, to date, no concrete evidence has surfaced to corroborate these accounts beyond the realm of oral tradition, passed down through the annals of time from long-lost sources. Wind Patterns and Transoceanic Voyages Moving beyond the African continent, our exploration takes us across the vast expanse of the Atlantic Ocean, eventually leading us to East Asia and the Polynesian Pacific. In our quest to understand how ancient civilizations may have traversed these formidable waters, we find valuable insights in the prevailing wind patterns. In our investigation of how these wind patterns may have influenced early transoceanic travel, we encounter a fascinating dichotomy. While prevailing winds in the Atlantic could have facilitated African exploration towards the east coast of the Americas, the Pacific Ocean presents a contrasting scenario. Here, eastward blowing winds posed a formidable obstacle to explorers seeking to journey eastward, particularly in proximity to the equator. However, at higher latitudes, a different phenomenon emerges the westerlies, prevailing winds that sweep from west to east. These westerlies collectively influence the Pacific, generating ocean currents that collectively form a dynamic ocean gyre, carrying water from the vicinity of Japan to the western shores of the American continent. Before delving into the prospect of ancient East Asians venturing to the Americas, it's essential to briefly recount the remarkable tale of the Three Keys. These individuals, while serving aboard a rice transport vessel in the Western Pacific, found themselves thrust into an extraordinary predicament. A devastating storm severed the ship's mast and rudder, leaving the crew marooned in the heart of the Pacific Ocean. Remarkably, owing to the nature of their vessel, loaded with rice, the crew possessed sufficient sustenance to endure over 14 months of isolation. During this harrowing period, the Pacific Ocean Current, now known as the Kuroshio Current, played a pivotal role. 
It carried the drifting boat and its resilient crew across the vast expanse of the ocean, ultimately depositing them on the shores of Washington State. Tragically, only the trio of key figures survived this arduous journey, with the remaining crew succumbing to nutrient deficiencies. While the story holds more intricate details, for our present discussion, it stands as the earliest documented instance of an unpropelled vessel from Japan reaching North America. Notably, numerous similar occurrences have been recorded subsequently, raising intriguing questions about whether such events were solely post-Columbian encounters. It is vital to emphasize that concrete evidence of these occurrences predating the colonization of the Americas remains elusive, with the existing accounts resting primarily on circumstantial foundations. Nevertheless, a closer examination of prevailing winds and ocean currents in the Pacific presents an intriguing narrative. The Kuroshio Current, which played a pivotal role in the Three Keys saga, finds its counterpart in the Southern Hemisphere as the South Pacific Current. This parallelism opens up the possibility of Polynesian explorations leading to contact with Native Americans, how sweet potatoes rewrote the story of Polynesian navigation. The Polynesians, renowned for their exceptional maritime prowess and navigation skills, offer a compelling link between these distant lands. One particularly compelling piece of evidence revolves around the sweet potato, a crop known to have originated in Central and South America. Intriguingly, European explorers venturing into the Pacific region encountered sweet potatoes thriving in Polynesian locales. Most Polynesian islands, primarily of volcanic origin, lack any geological connection to the American continent, suggesting an intriguing journey for this crop. Theories regarding the introduction of sweet potatoes to Polynesia vary. Some speculate that Polynesians may have voyaged to South America, bringing back sweet potato vine clippings for cultivation. Alternatively, it is proposed that this hardy crop may have dispersed itself over thousands of years via ocean currents. The former theory aligns with the observation that the Proto-Polynesian term for sweet potato, tamala, bears striking resemblance to the South American Quechua and Aymara words for the same crop, Tomar and Kumara. Intricately woven into the story of exploration and migration, these threads of evidence invite us to contemplate the remarkable possibilities of ancient cross-Pacific journeys, where intrepid Polynesian navigators may have bridged the vast expanse that separates East Asia from the Americas. The verdict? We would like to bring to your attention that there exist several intriguing instances akin to the one presented here. These range from Peruvian mummies discovered with traces of sap from a tree native to New Guinea to the uncanny resemblance between canoes in California and those constructed by the Polynesians, as previously mentioned. However, it is vital to underscore that none of these hypotheses have been substantiated with a substantial body of irrefutable evidence. Yet, it is irrefutable that individuals arrived in the Americas before the era of Christopher Columbus. This assertion is underscored by the presence of millions of people and the existence of ancient civilizations encountered upon the initial contact with the continent. Evidently, these early settlers can be considered the true pioneers of America. They were the first to establish enduring communities on this vast landmass. Thousands of years before Columbus, Life Erickson, or any other explorer ventured forth. The concept of discovery in this context is inherently relative, and it is imperative to note that this discussion does not advocate for a revision of established historical narratives. Rather, it seeks to prompt a thoughtful examination of our comprehension of American exploration and global history. Do you believe that Columbus truly deserves credit for discovering America, or should we reconsider ancient Egyptian exploration as a possible precedent? Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.